Number one, Ibble Dibble here. Hello friends, welcome to another fashion video, or a video about clothes anyway. I wouldn't call what Meghan Markle wears fashion. In my last fashion critique of Meghan titled, Why Duchess Meghan Markle Always Looks Bad in Photos, I talked about how Meghan's photo shoots are always an inconsistent, unflattering mess, primarily because she can't let a photographer and stylist lead with creative vision, but also because she herself entirely lacks said vision and is trying to appeal to the broadest audience possible, people she doesn't know or relate to, but imagines her fans to be professional women, yummy mummies, and small-town socialites. Megan doesn't dress like herself. She dresses like who she thinks her target audience aspires to be. She sees herself very much as a product rather than a person. Hence the copying Diana, copying Kate, copying Harry's exes, the dead-eyed gazes, and the repetitive posing. Megan, herself, personally, isn't communicating anything. She's not trying to. She's very much the empty vessel echoing back whatever you shout into it, hoping her fans project their own emotions onto her and love her all the more for it. Trying to make ourselves into a brand just turned us into products. We don't need to be a brand, do we? Hello? In the Netflix series, a whole section of H&M's Farewell to Royal Duties episode was devoted to Meghan claiming she dressed in neutrals as a working royal as a matter of precaution. So afraid were they that her natural beauty and magnetism would outshine every other royal on any given day until the end of time. Most of the time that I was in the UK, I rarely wore color. There was thought in that. To my understanding, you can't ever wear the same color as Her Majesty if there's a group event. But then you also shouldn't be wearing the same color as one of the other more senior members of the family. So I was like, well, what's a color that they'll probably never wear? Camel, beige, white. So I wore a lot of muted tones, but it also was so I could just blend in. Like, I'm not trying to stand out here. So there's no version of me joining this family and trying to not do everything I could to fit in. I don't want to embarrass the family. First of all, that's a lie. Royals were neutrals all the time. Secondly, she was passive aggressively trying to stand out even in the video she herself used as an example. Who wears a beige coat to Christmas? It's December, wear dark colors. <laughs> <laughs> and look at Harry freezing his ass off in lightweight flannel trying to indulge her. In fact, according to her, she was so fatigued by the dimming of her natural light that when she had finally let the royals go, ideologically, she was still there physically annoying everybody and abusing her staff. She purposefully dressed like a rainbow for her last two weeks. Until that last week in the UK. I rarely wore color and I never wanted to upstage or ruffle any feathers. So I just tried to blend in, but I wore a lot of color that week. Yeah. Just felt like, well, let's just look like a rainbow. Not as a final attention grab, how rude of you to even imagine that, but as an artistic celebration of her hard won freedom from oppression. We weren't with the family. It was our opportunity to go out with a bang, to be honest. Hey, shush. So why, post-royal family and royal wardrobe rules, is Meghan still wearing neutrals, still wearing outrageously expensive and relatively formal clothes, still not showing any skin, still piling on the accessories and jewelry, and still doing so no matter the occasion or weather? Yes, she's new money, so she really needs us to know she's part of the club now. Yes, she's in Hollywood. So there's a much higher level of materialism and superficiality, generally speaking. Yes, she's a narcissist who wants to remind her ex-husband in every single picture that she still got that love bracelet because he was a fool for her for so many years. A narcissist who wants to remind Harry that he gave her his mother's watch and all her other jewelry, and she'll be the one who decides when his time is up. A narcissist who wants to remind us, the thinking public, 
that whether we like it or not, she has fuck you money. And when she brings Saudi blood diamonds to get set at Lorraine Schwartz, no one says no to her. All of these are accurate, real reasons Megan dresses the way she does. But they're not the main reason. They're not the main reason she's trying to dress like your rich granny. The main reason is what she's been building towards since before she even joined the royal family. Affiliate marketing dollars. So what is affiliate marketing? It's the business model for cashback companies like Honey and Rakuten, but it's also one of the primary ways social media influencers earn money. The way it works is, when you click on a link an influencer has shared, a cookie with a timer is placed on your computer. Even if you leave the influencer's post and the website you clicked through to, and close your browser, and shut down your computer, and come back another day, go back to that site and buy anything at all while the cookie is still on your computer, even if you don't buy the product the influencer linked to, but something else, the influencer gets paid. A lifespan, percentage of purchase price paid, and number of days the influencer must wait before getting paid varies depending on the category of product purchased, the affiliate marketing network the influencer is a member of, and the terms of the agreement the individual influencer has with the vendor in question. In old school department store lingo, the influencers are working on a commission sales floor, and the first salesperson to help you claims you as their customer, no matter who rings you up in the end. The little screen recording you're watching now is me showing Alyssa Bell Tempo's affiliate marketing links because one of you mentioned her in my comment section on my last fashion video. You can see that the affiliate marketing network she uses is Shop Style Collective, which has since changed its name to Collective Voice. And when you click on one of her links for what she's wearing, which are typically shortened links, you can tell because they say bit.ly and you don't know exactly where you're going before you click, you click the link and briefly you see shopstyle.com forward slash action forward slash visit, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, before you're brought to the final destination with a cookie on your computer. Another really popular affiliate network for fashion influencers is reward style. When you click on a reward style affiliate link, you'll briefly see r style me forward slash slash in that web address bar before being forwarded to the final destination with a cookie on your computer. Some affiliate marketing networks are competitive for influencers to join, some are not. For reward style, influencers need to hit certain metrics in terms of views per month or number of followers and maintain a narrow focus and consistent aesthetic. Smaller, non-professional influencers can join the bigger, less picky, but lower paying affiliate marketing networks who make their money on volume and therefore don't care as much about the quality, consistency, or turnaround on their influencers. These networks include Rakuten, ShareASale, Impact Radius, Awin, CJ, and many more. Today, we're talking about the platforms that focus on selling glam. Clothes, makeup, jewelry, skincare, hotels, spas, etc. But there are affiliate platforms for everything you can imagine. Dog food, medical coupon clubs, boats, farm machinery. Only very rarely does a brand do exclusively in-house affiliate marketing because it generally isn't worth the effort. Really, really big corporations like eBay do it. No matter who you are, it's 1% and a 24-hour cookie. They don't need you to make sales. Amazon, same. Most categories are between 1% and 5%, with bounties of 2 or $3 if you get someone to sign up for the first time to a subscription service like Audible, Music Unlimited, etc. High-end luxury brands will usually have a private affiliate program for people who really move their product but aren't their muses. Contractually obligated celebrities who star in ad campaigns for designers, wear them exclusively on the red carpet, and get gifted a lot of free stuff is a different marketing concept with its whole own budget that's been around forever. With legendary partnerships like Givenchy with Audrey Hepburn or Chanel with Inez de la Fressange to show for it. A current example would be two-time Oscar award-winning actress Anne Hathaway, who wears exclusively Valentino dresses and exclusively Bulgari jewelry. Anne Hathaway does not need or want to hawk things on Instagram or a blog. 
In fact, she probably perceives it as rather beneath her. And I'm not saying anything is wrong with that. Gwyneth Paltrow and Reese Witherspoon have made a good living with it, but most actresses aren't into it. They don't perceive it as their metier. That's the fashion milieu Megan expected to enter when she returned to Hollywood. She tried, but it became clear rather quickly that Megan was never going to be a Dior girl, a Chanel girl, even a Carolina Herrera girl. Non-muse, non-exclusive influencers with direct affiliate marketing deals are a newer phenomenon. The first generation of these undeclared, under-the-radar partnerships was around 15 years ago between Brian Boy and Marc Jacobs, Tavi Gevinson and Prada, etc. Long story short, if you're not a big enough star to get one of these super exclusive deals with designers, you need to pretend you never wanted one in the first place because you have amazing, authentic, original style. And there truly are some fashion people who are above this entire game. Daphne Guinness does not need their money, does not need their labels, does not need their network. <laughs> Neither does Catherine, obviously. Even though Daphne and Catherine are at either extreme of the fashion spectrum, with Daphne giving us conceptual, avant-garde, absurdist, otherworldly, and Catherine giving us practical, conservative, traditional, feminine. Both women are totally authentic. They have complete freedom to be completely themselves. Megan is not above the fray for financial or emotional reasons. And so she tries to cultivate a perception of authenticity, which never rings true. Unless you're Harry, I guess. How has he still not noticed the difference between how she used to dress and behave when she was trying to snag him and how she dresses and behaves now that she's got him? She's not authentic just because she keeps repeating the word in your face all the time, Harry. The perception of authenticity is a big part of how influencers encourage their fandom to buy. And with affiliate marketing, influencers don't have to spend any time negotiating deals with brands or sign any exclusivity or non-compete agreements or ever shout out any designer by name anywhere if they don't want to. This protects the influencer's facade of integrity, independence, creativity, and unique taste. All they have to do is take photos of themselves that fit their personal brand, sign up for the affiliate marketing platforms that best suit their audience, and pay the highest commissions for their reach, host where to buy links on all their pictures, kick back and collect. If they're good at their job, you'll never even know they sold you something. When Megan describes her pre-Harry website as being a great business, this is what she's talking about. She was posting her live, laugh, love photos on Instagram and her blog, showing up in Google results for anyone searching either suits cast members or costumes or cool things to do in Toronto and selling Panama hats, bronzer, yoga mats, and leggings through Holt Renfrew and Nordstrom links, raking in 5, 6, 11% on holidays. So how much money exactly do affiliate marketers make? The bigger their reach, the bigger the number of sales made, and the bigger their cut. No matter the target market, a credible influencer can typically get as many as 10% of their own followers to buy a self-branded or collab product, 2% to buy an explicitly recommended product, and maintain a background constant sales flow of around half a percent of their total followers just buying anything they've posted but not discussed any given week. That girl you knew in high school who has a kind of successful local mommy blog probably works with three or four of the big affiliate networks and will make between 2 and 8% in 90 days after you click something she linked to on the Target website. That million-ish follower YouTuber or TikToker is getting 8 to 15% on whatever she can convince you to buy from Shein or Selfridges. And market makers like the Kardashians are getting not only multi-million dollar contracts, sponsored weddings and Italian vacations and piles of free designer clothes from Dolce & Gabbana and the like, they're also probably getting 15% on every click-through web purchase redirected from their socials. Lots of retailers have front doors and back doors, so if the real real 
doesn't think you're stylish or influential enough to offer you their typical 5 to 8% commission and 14-day cookie, you can still make money off of linking to them by being a member of the Magic Links affiliate network. But you and Magic Links split that 5 to 8% 50-50. Category counts. Beauty products typically pay a lower percentage than clothes, for example, but what really makes the difference is price tag. It's a lot more lucrative to be a luxury influencer than mid-market or low-end. A cape from Loro Piana costs around $8,000, and a cape from Shein costs around $20. No matter what affiliate network you're part of or how many followers you have, you'd have to sell 400 Shein capes to make the same amount of money as you do selling just one Loro Piana cape. So how can affiliate marketers make the most money possible? By wearing the most expensive clothes imaginable that would work on the greatest number of body types and on people of any complexion at any age. In other words, the neutral colored cashmere tents and silk separates we so often see Megan in lately. It's even easier and even more lucrative to sell stuff people of any size or shape can wear. Shoes, handbags, sunglasses, and jewelry. It's even better if you can stay totally trend-free, focusing completely on classic silhouettes and hero products. For example, if someone clicks on an influencer's link to a pair of boring black denim straight-cut jeans two years after the fact, perhaps that exact style is gone, but a very similar, very slightly updated style is available. And once they're on the website, they still will very likely buy this almost exactly the same but slightly updated version. Hero products like the Dior Lady Die Bag or Cartier Justin Clou bracelet will literally never stop selling. Those affiliate links will be profitable for 100 years. Before Harry, Megan was trying to sell trends to aspirational singletons. <laughs> to use one of her favorite words. Post Harry, she's positioning herself as older, more sophisticated, and much, much wealthier. Megan isn't dressing like this because this is her style. According to the latest reports, she's about to relaunch the TIG and she wants to make the maximum amount of money possible. Megan is trying to sell classics to the super wealthy. Let's check out a sample outfit. This is what she audaciously wore to visit a shelter for homeless pregnant women. The Max Mara Lilia coat, $5,990. Valentino Roman stud flats, $875. The Valentino prescription frames for sunglasses, $200. The Cartier Justin Clou necklace, in size small with diamonds, $40,000. A Max Mara cashmere blend sweater, $875. Altuzara Tristan trousers, $600. A Chanel 19 bag, $6,400. A Cartier Love Bracelet, $6,900. Diana's Cartier Tank Watch, $24,000. Diana's Diamond Tennis Bracelet, also from Cartier, $29,000. Megan's Bensley & Skinner Diamond Tennis Bracelet from Charles, $9,700. And Megan's Jennifer Meyer Bracelet, $3,000. The total price of her outfit, not counting her wedding or engagement rings, and not counting her earrings because I don't recognize them and can't identify them, not that I need to for this example to serve, is $127,540. And I have to say it one more time, I'm so sorry. This is what she wore to visit a shelter for homeless pregnant women. Pregnant homeless women. Pregnant women with nowhere to go to pretend to fold baby clothes. Could you imagine the life-changing effect $127,000 would have for any of these women or the shelter itself? But back to counting Megan's money. If just one fan bought one of each thing she's wearing, conservatively estimating, she'd get a 6% kickback on clothes and shoes and a 5% kickback on bag and jewelry, she would make $6,470. Imagine how much she'd make if 10 crazy sugars decided to buy a diamond tennis bracelet through her, or if 20 bought her Max Mara coat. These numbers are well within reason given her huge reach. She is very, very internationally famous. Before, when she was living royal life, she had to pretend that she wasn't merching. And there are rumors that she hid behind websites like Megan's Mirror 
to do her affiliate marketing anonymously. Now that she's relaunching the TIG, she doesn't have to hide. If she feels embarrassed about making money this way, she can always claim a portion of the proceeds are going to Archwell, her charity, and then only actually give a tiny fraction of what she earns or whatever her accountants say is best for her personal tax situation each quarter. And that's not even the end of it. Celebrities like Megan can double dip by staging paparazzi photos with Backgrid, Splash, Mega, or similar agencies that specialize in fake pop stroll shoots. Out of royalties earned on the pictures, which will inevitably run in tabloids and on gossip blogs, the paparazzo usually gets 20 to 30 percent, the cooperative celebrity gets cut in at around the same rate, and the agency gets the remainder. A single everyday fake pop photo only brings in five or ten dollars, so photographers typically take hundreds of photos of the shortest walk and sell sets of 10 and 20 very similar but not exactly the same photos to different media outlets. So if 200 international media outlets buy a set of 15 pictures each, Megan just earned $5,000 walking from her car into a restaurant. Is there such a thing as triple dipping, you might ask? Why, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. In Hollywood, New York, most cities actually, plenty of restaurants and clubs will happily comp meals, drinks, tables, tickets, everything, anything for big celebrities like Harry and Meghan. Maybe Meghan paid for lunch with her coworker. Maybe she got everything comped in exchange for being photographed walking into the place. Plenty of influencers even email restaurants in advance saying they'd like to eat there, but do require a publicity fee of a few hundred bucks. And some restaurants do accept. I don't believe Megan is that crass, but we won't really know until she's back in the merchant game for a couple years and the request emails start leaking, which they always inevitably do. So quite possibly, Megan can earn $10,000, $30,000 and a free $300 lunch just walking out her door to do nothing. Because let's be serious, all she did at Harvest Home was pose for photos. How much of that money do you think the shelter will ever get? That's my rant for today. Toodles. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Um.